Paddy Tillett, president of the City Club. Today, one of the community services for which the City Club is renowned, the presentation of one of our ballot measure reports, will take place. You should know that all City Club reports are written by our volunteer members who are carefully screened for conflict of interest before they're appointed to serve on a research committee. City Club committees thoroughly research available information and interview experts on all sides of the, each issue they examine. You, who represent the entire City Club membership, now have the opportunity to discuss, debate and vote to accept or reject the study committee recommendations. Voting cards were distributed to City Club members at the door. If you don't have a card and would like one, please raise your hand and a staff member will bring one to you. Copies of the Measure 2630 report are available on your tables and also on the information table at the back of the room. You should each have received copies of the report with this week's bulletin. Before being published, this report and its recommendations were reviewed by the City Club Research Board and Board of Governors. The report, which includes both majority and minority recommendations, is now ready for your consideration. Alan Brickley, Chair of the Study Committee, will first present background on the report. After Alan is finished, Heather Kometz will present the majority report recommendation. Following Heather's presentation, Brian Redd will present the minority report recommendation. And upon completion of Heather Kmetz's presentation, she'll move for approval of the majority report recommendation, which is to say a, a yes vote on measure 2630 and to kill the minority recommend, recommendation. Now, if you think this is getting complicated now, just wait. <laughs> Brian will then present the minority report recommendation, which is to vote no on the measure and move that the minority recommendation be substituted for the majority recommendation, thus killing the majority recommendation. You're with me so far, of course. <laughs> I will then open the meeting for debate and comment from the City Club members on whether to substitute the minority recommendation for the majority recommendation. If you're in favor of the substituting the minority recommendation, then you should approach the micro microphone labeled yes. And if you're against substituting the minority recommendation, then you should approach the no microphone. If the substitution is approved by a simple majority vote, we will proceed to vote on a, uh, to approve the ballot measure 2630 report with the minority recommendation, which is a no vote on the ballot measure. In the case that the substitution is not approved, we'll return to the main motion and vote to approve the report with the original majority recommendation or a yes vote. Normally this isn't much of a problem because it's pretty clear, but it's going to be close run today. Please be reminded that it's club policy that only City Club members will be allowed to participate in the discussion, debate, and to vote on the report. Before introducing Alan Brickley, I want to review the club's bylaws on report votes. And you'll find copies of these bylaws on your tables. The following motions are allowed. To accept or reject individual report recommendations, to postpone consideration or further consideration to a subsequent meeting, which is a debatable motion requiring a two-thirds majority for adoption, to postpone consideration of the report indefinitely, which also requires a two-thirds majority vote. A motion to table is out of order. Greg McPherson, past City Club Research Board Chair, will serve as parliamentarian and timekeeper for the debate today. Now I will turn the podium over to Alan Brickley, Chair of the Measure 2630 Report Committee, to present an overview of the report. Alan. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I want to express my personal appreciation for the opportunity to serve as the chair of this committee uh, and this vital issue of uh, changing the uh, form of the Portland City government. Uh, you'll hear more about it from Heather and, and Brian as they uh, express the individual points of view from both the majority and the minority. I'd also like to uh, express my thanks to the witnesses who made this possible. Uh, this information without the cooperation and the participation of the various witnesses uh, we would not have the quality of information which we currently do. Also like to spend a moment and thank you very much to Robert Ball for bringing this matter to the fore. It's an important issue which uh, it certainly is uh, within the uh, important issues that we need to discuss today. And particularly I would like to thank the members of the committee, several of them who are here 
I think it would be fair to say that we engaged in a broad-ranging, constructive, and occasionally lively debate on the question. And I suspect we may hear more of that later today. <coughs> if I could introduce some of the members of the committee, um, Nancy Glarum, I believe Nancy's here, Andrew Kayser, Carter Kennedy, Heather Kometz, who is going to be uh, presenting the majority, Ken Ray, who, yes, there he is, um, Megan Steele, and I would like particularly to uh, recognize and thank Paul Meyer, who uh, is a, a member of the majority who's sitting here, but uh, Paul's uh, participation in the committee was, I believe, particularly helpful because not only did he serve on previous committees involving the same question and the same issue, but uh, his insistence on the careful look at each and every issue was very helpful to the committee, so thank you very much, Paul. Members of the minority, including myself, Caitlin Baggett, um, seated here, Carolyn Bullard, and Brian Redd, who will present the minority point of view. With that, I presume I'll just let Heather take it. Thank you, Alan. They say if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, there is a widespread feeling in Portland that it is broken. Even those against the passage of Measure 2630 seem to agree that there are serious functional problems with Portland's commission form of government. Your majority found the commission form to be inefficient, dysfunctional, and indeed a nationwide oddity in a city of Portland's size. Among cities with a population over 125,000, the research indicated that Portland is the only city in the nation that has not abandoned the commission form of government. The commission form combines executive and legislative power in the same individuals. We do not have a system of checks and balances. Rather, we have turf protection. We also do not have anyone to hold responsible for uncoordinated decision making. So it's broken. What do we do to fix it? Over the past 15 years, the City Council has pursued ongoing efforts to remedy some of the problems that result from the diffusion of executive authority in Portland's government. The efforts have focused primarily on centralizing certain financial and administrative services, but have also attempted to improve coordination between bureaus. Despite these good faith efforts, at some point we need to realize that our talented elected officials are fighting the system not excelling within it. We need a structure that will enable Portland to grow and address the increasingly complex problems of a growing community without sacrificing the livability we've come to expect. After extensive research and more than two dozen interviews with individuals in government service, neighborhood associations, and business groups, the majority of your committee believes that Measure 2630 will accomplish what the patchwork efforts of the past 15 years have been unable to achieve. We found there to be three major benefits to the strong mayor council form of government. One, unifying executive responsibility under the mayor will result in better value for our tax <coughs> dollars by coordinating efforts under a single individual. Two, creating a full-time legislative council will improve citizen representation and legislative effectiveness. And three, electing council members by district will make it less expensive to run for office and will open the door to more economically diverse candidates. Our report supports these conclusions. In fact, between 1961 and 1999, four city club committees have come to similar conclusions, urging Portland to change its form of government. So why haven't we fixed it? Perhaps it's because the rhetoric gets in the way. For example, by signing an initiative petition, 32,712 citizens brought Measure 2630 to the ballot. Not a single man. We should also clarify that contrary to what was initially reported in the press, the assertion that the measure is riddled with flaws is simply incorrect. In fact, the only drafting error we were able to substantiate was a date error. The measure includes an effective date of January 1, 2004, which should have read January 1, 2005. A majority of the current council has already indicated that the date would be corrected if the measure passes, rendering this a non-issue. 
We encourage you not to be waylaid by the rhetoric, not to be distracted by diversionary tactics. It has been 36 long years since this issue has been to the ballot. A charter review process would surely be beneficial to facilitate the change to the strong mayor council form of government, but one is not planned. And despite all the structural problems of the past years, none was initiated. Even if it had been, I suggest that a charter review process would not likely bring to the ballot a solution much different from the one before you today. While there may have been different nuances, any collective process results in compromise. It took the committee four months to gather, evaluate, and distill the information. Despite being generally well-informed and active in our communities, most of us had never before thought so much about the form of government. And in the beginning, we were not even sure it made much of a difference. What the majority of your committee found is that it does make a difference. Simply put, we believe that the strong mayor council form of government proposed under Measure 2630 will enable our elected officials to be more responsive, responsible, and accessible to us, and will enable our unique, active citizenry to have a greater voice in city affairs, holding elected officials directly responsible for decision making and demanding coordinated efforts among bureaus. We need to fix what is broken now. I move the adoption of the majority recommendation to vote yes on Measure 2630. Thank you. City Club members and guests, this measure proposes a dramatic change to our form of government. The proponents of the measure, therefore, have the burden of demonstrating that we will be better off with this change than without it. We in the minority conclude that they have failed to meet that burden. After many interviews of many knowledgeable people, we found very little evidence the city of Portland will be better by adopting the measure. In fact, we found whatever potential benefits may exist from the measure are outweighed by its potential negative impacts. Is the city of Portland functioning perfectly? Of course not. No city does. Are there inefficiencies? Certainly there are. And there are in any organization, be it a city or a corporation. Does our commission form of government have its own unique inefficiencies? Yes, it does. In fact, we found that there needs to be much better coordination among the council members and among their respective bureaus. And that process was actually begun in earnest two years ago when the city council created the Office of Management and Finance and the position of Chief Administrative Officer and set the course for consolidation of administrative functions throughout the various city bureaus. Significant progress is being made. The fact that there's resistance to this process <clears throat> is both expected and healthy. Turf battles exist in any organization. And they certainly would exist in the strong mayor form that's proposed by the majority. The key is that the city council has identified that problem and is doing something to fix it. It's been 40 years since the city, the voters of the Portland, were presented with the choice of retaining or abandoning our form of government. Some of the arguments made in favor of a change then are being made today. Supporters of change then, as now, argued that the Commission former government could not adapt to meet the challenges of the future. Well, we believe that Portland's successes over the past 40 years have proven those predictions wrong. Some proponents of the measure seem to want it both ways, that our successes have been despite our form of government and our failures have been because of it. We do not believe that our successes or our failures can be so easily pigeonholed. It's far too simplistic to assert that the Water Bureau billing systems or the Willamette Superfund listing or other high-profile issues that we faced in the city 
were caused simply by our form of government. Things just aren't that simple. The fact is, we've done as well as we have in this city with our current form of government, and not some other form. And the reason it has performed and has survived is because it has evolved. And it will continue to evolve and to address new challenges we face in the future. The real issue is what priorities we focus on, not our form of government. If we need to focus on some issues more than we're doing, such as economic development, we can certainly do that without changing our form of government. Your minority shares the concerns expressed by the League of Women Voters of Portland about the measure's replacement of at-large elections with district voting. We agree with the League that at-large elections serve the citizens of Portland the best. We are deeply concerned about the threat of parochial politics that will naturally flow from district elections. With at-large elections, the paramount interest of the city are at stake. With district elections, it is inevitable that the interest of the district will take precedence over the general welfare of the city. District representatives will be elected because of what they promise to do for their districts. And they'll be re-elected or not based on what they do or don't do for their districts. With that focus on individual districts, we believe the general public interest of the city as a whole will get blurred into the background. We found no reason to believe that the measure would result in better qualified managers of our city bureaus. In fact, the overwhelming consensus among those we interviewed supported a finding that our bureaus are currently managed by professionals. Yes, at the very top of each bureau sits a commissioner who may or may not have had any prior management experience and may not understand in the workings of their specific bureaus when they first assume office. But that's going to be the same thing with a strong mayor form of government. The mayor may or may not have any management experience and may or may not know anything about the individual bureaus, yet the mayor will be in charge of all of the bureaus. While we don't dispute that this initiative process is a valid process, we believe that Portlanders can do better when it comes to something as fundamental and important as a change in our form of government. Such an issue should not be left to the design of a few people. Let's step back, take a careful and comprehensive look at what problems we have, at what problems we have and <laughs> how to solve them. Let's impanel a blue ribbon group of knowledgeable people with varied perspectives. If that means making charter changes or changing our form of government, then so be it. Or perhaps we should modify, continue to modify our existing form of government. But whatever the decision, let's not make that decision until after we've done our work. Adopting this measure is the easy way. Let's not take the easy way. Let's do it right. For those of you who came to today's meeting and having decided that you wanted to support the measure um, or leaning in that direction, the minority asks that you reconsider your position. And I leave with you the words of Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter, who at the last moment in a crucial Supreme Court opinion changed his mind and reversed a position he'd held for many years. And Justice Frankfurter said, wisdom so rarely comes that it shouldn't be rejected merely because it comes late. <laughs> Therefore, I move the substitution of the minority recommendation to vote no on measure 2630 for the majority recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you also, Heather and uh, Alan. Brian Redd has moved that the minority report be substituted for the main motion. We'll now debate Brian's motion to substitute the minority recommendation for the majority recommendation which is a no vote on the ballot measure. The microphone to my far right is labeled for this measure, for substitution, and the one to my left is against substitution. I'll try to alternate between the two positions and we'll first recognize someone favoring the motion to substitute the minority report. 
Please respect the rule that only City Club members may debate the report. Please limit your comments to two minutes so that all who want to speak may do so. There are a great many people here today and our time for this part of the program is limited. So um, please only come forward if you have something to say that has not already <coughs> been said. Um, so with that, uh, carry on, Chris. City Club bills itself as the conscience of the city. And perhaps in no other area than challenging Portland's commission form of government has City Club carried this out so consistently and relentlessly, almost a century of advocacy on this issue. Which is exactly why I am so concerned that City Club might put its endorsement behind this measure, which is so opposite the tradition of City Club advocacy in this area. Let me compare and contrast how City Club has done this and how this measure does it. Uh, when City Club has used the initiative to bring ch charter reform to the ballot, it's been done after uh, the thorough and rigorous City Club study process with input from a variety of sources and segments of the community. Uh, in contrast, this measure was drafted by Robert Ball and his lawyer after they talked to whomever they chose to talk to with no form of public input and apparently without access to a calendar. In 1996, the City Club Study Committee on Initiative Reform bemoaned the fact that paid signature gathering could get almost any idea on the ballot. And indeed, that's what's happened here. Uh, this measure was funded by $83,000 of paid signature gathering to get the necessary signatures to put it on the ballot. Now, Charlie Hinkle reminds us that paid signature gathering is constitutional in Oregon, but I would remind Charlie the pornography is also constitutional in Oregon. I don't think City Club wants to endorse either. Uh, and finally, uh, when City Club has brought charter reform to the ballot, they've done so as part of a broad coalition. Uh, the last time this included the League of Women Voters, the Young Democrats, the Young Republicans. That coalition does not exist today, and in fact, our traditional partner, the League, is in opposition. I urge you to vote for the Minority Report and against the initiative. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Paul Meyer, a member of the club, and I also was one privileged to be on the committee in 61, and I was sub-chair of the committee that drafted what went on the ballot in 1966. And I, if anybody would be offended at not being consulted, I suppose I should be, but I'm not. If a good idea comes along, it shows it's a good idea. Nothing has happened for wisdom that Mr. Red calls for uh, to change what the wisdom of the city club was and has been all through the years. The commission form, the five mayor system of government is not functioning. And the, I'd like to address the issue of the, the uh, Mr. Red said that two years uh, they've tried to put in effect a chief administrative officer. Well, that process has been going on for over 15 years. And in the last two, and it's not worked. You know the chief administrative officer, while nominally in the mayor's office, is pointed by and is, serves at the pleasure of the council. So the as chief administrative officer has no more authority than the mayor. And the centralization isn't working. And there's evidence as late as January and February that you find in your report that it's not working. I'd like to speak a minute about the district. We had an at-large, uh, all at-large council in our original proposal. And uh, that is not current trend in political science. The at-large disenfranchises a variety of people. In Birmingham, Alabama, it disenfranchised blacks because at-large could only be white people. In, in, uh, now, in, it do, that doesn't apply in Portland. But what does apply in Portland is it disenfranchises people economically. To mount a citywide campaign takes resources that many people do not have. Now, I know people in this room have access. They have access to the current commissioners, but most people in Portland do not have access. The commissioners brag to us, some of them, opposed to this measure. They only spend one day a week on legislative matters. The rest is administrative. Now, you cannot have access from voters under those circumstances. Thank you, Thank you Paul. <laughs> Mark Kirkmeyer, club member former chair of the city's Office of Neighborhood Involvement Bureau Advisory Committee, 
and a longtime member of my board association near Roseville High School in North Portland, a quote-unquote economically disadvantaged area. As someone in North Portland, it, this measure has tremendous gut appeal to me. North Portland hasn't had a city council member of our own since Terry shrunk some 34 years ago. And this measure does have the promise of possibly electing a city council member from, from our area. But my response is basically, so what if that council member doesn't have any authority, doesn't have any power, doesn't have any influence, as under this measure they would not. The, this, this measure would make a change that's uh, analogous to what, to what the mayor's power versus the city council powers will be. Um, it's, it's analogous to the, to the principal of Roosevelt High School and in her student council. We can do much better than that. Please support the minority report. Thank you. Thank you, Ken Ray, a uh, City Club member and a member of the Committee on the Majority Side. I urge uh, the opposition of the substitution of the Minority Report. I'm was standing here still trying to figure out the connections between uh, paid and signature gathering and, and pornography, but then I realized they're not issues related to this debate. This measure got here by illegitimate means. Let's argue the merits of the proposal, not how it got here. Uh, some of the opponents of this measure will argue that um, 26 bureaus, I'm not even sure that's the correct number, but however many departments and bureaus there's, there are, that's too many for one administrator to handle. Uh, we need to spread it out among five, five individuals. Folks, at the state level, at the federal level, we empower governors, presidents, other executives with multiple divisions, hundreds of agency commission and bureaus uh, and commission appointments to, to appoint with the consent of a legislative body and then remove at will. This is no different from what we see in other organizations. Secondly, some have made the, uh, the argument that what Portland has is currently is a chief executive with four divisional vice presidents. That's not in reality the case. Um, you would not have in a business organization an executive and four divisional vice presidents who have no reporting responsibility to the executive. Uh, this makes sense from an organizational standpoint in consolidating uh, city bureaus and functions. I think the report speaks for itself, particularly the arguments on the majority side, and I urge rejection of the minority report. Thank you. Lily Mandel, City Club member. To name this the Good Government Initiative is wildly deceptive. Instead, it should be named the Bad, Bloated Bureaucracy Initiative, incapable of dealing with citizens' problems. If this initiative passes, we will have a mayor who is not required to listen to the concerns of ordinary citizens at city council before wielding virtually absolute power. If we are lucky, we may elect a benevolent despot. This is too big a risk to take. Another wildly deceptive claim is that of better neighborhood representation. A neighborhood council member will be virtually powerless to fix neighborhood problems because bureau heads will be responsible only to the mayor. The initiative attempts to scam us into believing that powerless figureheads will be able to do more for us than city commissioners who have the authority to directly solve our neighborhood problems. This ball sponsored initiative is truly a foul ball. <laughs> Thank you. Megan Steele, I come to you today as a member of the uh, majority side of your research committee and as someone who has had the privilege to be a public servant for 30 years working in, I just counted them, I think there's six, uh, six government organizations in three states with various forms of, of um, structure. And I predict that someone today is going to, to say with alarm, do you want the city of Portland to become more like Multnomah County or the state of Oregon? They will suggest, unfairly, that this measure will do just that, that they are comparing apples to oranges. As a rule, cities across this country are better managed organizations than counties or states or certainly the federal government. And that's because cities are fundamentally easier to manage. Their revenues are local, locally generated, and as a result, there is more local control and predictability. 
Cities have it easy compared to counties and states because cities are not responsible for providing social services and mental health and the other inextricable problems related to poverty, all with inadequate funding. It's also unfair to suggest that city council will become more like the state legislature if this measure pass passes. The state legislature is partisan and part-time. A better comparison would be to Multnomah County's Board of County Commissioners. Like the proposed city council structure, the board has full-time nonpartisan officials elected on a district basis. The county board functions well, attracting quality people to legislative offices and then working together constructively. Each member has more than full-time duties as legislators and policy makers, providing leadership on policy initiatives that match their particular interests and expertise. So let's compare cities to cities. The strong mayor form of government works well for cities. We do have a reason to be proud of our city and how it runs, but this measure offers us a chance to make it better. Thank you. I am Bud Clark, Portland's mayor from 1985 to 1993. Portland is a unique city with a unique form of government, a unique city with a unique form of government, and I feel very strongly that it should stay unique. We can make changes to the charter with public input, but not this radical Byzantine proposal that attempts to copy cities with far less vision and, li and livability than Portland. Portland's Council of Five, with each member, including the mayor, having one vote and no veto, it takes only three votes to pass or defeat an ordinance or a budget. As a member of my neighborhood association, we lobbied the council and stopped the Thurman Vaughn Corridor Freeway. We saved a lot of housing, some of which had already been purchased by the state. That's only one example of many neighborhood association successes. As an unknown, I ran for mayor. I borrowed $50,000 on my house, and to many people's surprise, I won. <laughs> my council and I got a lot done, and we did it by working together. We had goal-setting sessions where we determined our goals for the next and following years. I would then assign the bureaus to council members according to their interests. With goals set, it was wagons ho! We gave the bureaucracy direction, and they accomplished our goals with great efficiency. When I took office, we had to redo the budget immediately. Police and fire had just been awarded a 10% wage increase. There were no reserves, and we were in a recession. We, the four council members, and myself made the tough decisions so that when I left office, we left Mayor Katz with $20 million in reserves, and the AMBAC Corporation, an international insurer of governments, recognized Portland as the best-managed city of its size in the United States. The council I served with over eight years was a diverse group. Mildred Schwab, Mike Lindbergh, Margaret Strong, Dick Bogle, Bob Koch, Earl Blumenauer, Gretchen Kafori. We accomplished a lot, completed the Performing Arts Center, built the Convention Center, created a nationally recognized homeless plan, established community policing, annexed Hayden Island, expanded the city east aggression, extended the Transit Mall to Union Station, and purchased it, created South Columbia South Shore Urban Renewal District, expanded the number of sister cities, one of which led to the construction of the Chinese Garden and Salmon Springs Fountain, routed Max West past the Goose Hollow Inn, <laughs> these changes, <laughs> these changes as more came out because Portland's form of government rather than is form of government rather than in spite of it. We have a unique form of government that has helped make Portland unique and great. Don't change what is not broken. <laughs> Thank you. Greetings, I'm Jeff Merkley, City Club member and representative from Far East Portland. And I bring to you a view based on my years involved in this city, both active in the downtown and as a resident of Far East Portland, and as a housing advocate for Northeast Portland. I found that it was extraordinarily difficult as a housing advocate to get the attention of the city council. We were fortunate to have an excellent advocate who will be uh, speaking in a moment. But the challenge, the core challenge in Portland is that when you have everyone run citywide, you have a situation where people almost always come from a downtown core and they are elected largely from, by, and in response for the downtown core. You have a situation where the city has grown enormously. From the downtown viewpoint, you look east and you see Mount Tabor and you think about that far reach out there somewhere and you forget that the city goes on for another five miles past Mount Tabor. That part of the city, when incorporated, was promised it would be a relevant part of the operation of the city. And the first thing that the city did after incorporation was to break a core promise made during the incorporation process. People in this city do feel vastly disenfranchised if they are not part of the downtown core. I believe in a city that is inclusive, that cares as much about minority housing in Northeast Portland, 
or about the problems of streets and potholes east of Mount Tabor, as it does as Chinese gardens and the wonderful streetcar and the wonderful facilities of downtown Portland. If we want an inclusive system, we have to have voices that reflect the diversity of this city and celebrate that diversity. And so I encourage you to celebrate inclusiveness and diversity and join in defeating this minority report. Thank you. Hi, I'm Doug Capps, uh, City Club member. I'm, I'm a, a great believer in reading the reports of the City Club, and there are City Club reports on the table if you haven't read them. And I would bring your attention to page 22. And the question was, or is, are there critical problems with the functioning of city government? And then read what it says. Portland is an internationally recognized uh, as, a highly, uh, as a vital, highly livable city. The city's urban planning is revered throughout the nation and is often credited with fostering Portland's active business community, growing cultural life, innovative parks, diverse transportation options. The City Auditor's Annual Service Efforts and Accomplishments Report found that citizen satisfaction is increasing and documented the many people who continue to move here choosing Portland as their home. Portland City Government has been independently rated as the third best operating city in the country. I would say that this is a solution that's been proposed in search of a problem. This has been a city that works, at least it's worked pretty well, and I believe that's in part because city council members represent the city as a whole. So I would ask that you please vote for the minority report. Thanks. Ted Falk, uh, member, and I was chair of the City Club's um, study of housing density a couple of years ago. And I will be uh, very brief in light of the uh, number of people at the other microphone. But our study did find a lot of evidence that the system is broken. Uh, just a couple of examples of elementary uh, governmental functions that the city did not seem to be able to carry on. First of all, the, uh, uh, although the city has outstanding city planning staff, the city planning staff were unable to function due to competing demands for different commissioners for projects that were mutually inconsistent. Uh, another example would be uh, building permits. We know there have been a lot of examples of businesses that have left the city because of inability to get uh, building permits. And although a re-engineering process was initiated and it certainly made some progress in the orderly issuing of business permits, that whole permitting process itself was compromised by the tug of war among the commissioners. Thank you. I'm John Russell, City Club member. Although I strongly oppose the specifics of the ball initiative, I always hate to get dragged into a debate on the specifics because debating the specifics dignifies the process that got, to, got us to where we are. And the process, I believe, makes a mockery of the history and the really proud history of Portland's public involvement process. The process was simply a developer and his land use attorney in consultation with others drafted an initiative, paid signature gatherers to, to get it on the ballot, and, and the voters are faced with a simple up or down vote on the status quo versus the initiative. Despite the fact that there's thousands of permutations and combinations, even if you like the strong mayor form of government. And I contrast this to the wonderful process uh, done 10 years ago, the Metro Charter Review Commission in a, in a group chaired by Hardy Myers, two dozen people on the committee. They spent a year doing public meetings all around the region and what they came up with, frankly, was something different than they had started with, and that's really the point. This, uh, that's the sort of process we need uh, to get something in, in front of the voters that, that people have been involved with in this formulation. Thank you. I, I just interject at this point to say that uh, we will continue the debate until such time as someone calls the question, and until such time as there is a two-thirds majority to cease the debate and, and, uh, and, and take a vote. So I just want you to understand that. I took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> I move the previous question. The question is moved. I, th I think to proceed, we need a two-thirds uh, um, majority vote in favor of, of halting the, the, um, the discussion. So with those in favor 
of halting the discussion um, signify by holding up their voter cards. Those opposed? Pretty clear. I think, I think you've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> we will now proceed with the vote to substitute the minority report, which is a no on measure 2630, for the majority report. The vote requires a simple majority for approval. So I would ask those of you who uh, favor substituting the minority report for the majority report to raise your cards. Those who, uh, and those who are opposed. I think that is a clear majority. Is there a general agreement about that? The City Club membership has voted to oppose substitution of the minority report. <laughs> Just checking that you're listening. <laughs> the City Club membership has voted to approve the substitution of the minority report for the majority report. We'll now vote to adopt the ballot measure 2630 report with the minority report recommendation. In this vote, you're voting to approve the minority recommendation. A yes vote is to approve the report with this recommendation. A no vote opposes this motion as in, in, is in favor of the club taking no position on the measure at this time. Is there any more discussion? I understand that the motion is to adopt the minority report and that the city club could either uh, approve the minority report or uh, take no position at all. Is, am I correct, Mr. Chairman? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to clarify, if you vote yes, the club will take a position against the measure. Is that clear? I, I'm getting up to urge the club to take no position. While I would, I would ask those to. I, this is a new debate. It's a new debate. And I'm getting up to urge the club not to adopt the minority report, but to take no position at all. In listening to the debate, it became clear that there was a lot of resentment about the way in which this particular ballot measure came to the ballot. Uh, that may be a reasonable uh, basis for opposing it, but I think it puts the City Club in a very strange position where it opposes a measure that basically is in accordance with some 40 years of City Club reports and policies and will, I will tell you, totally kill any attempt to reform city government for another generation. It's been 36 years since this matter was previously on the ballot, there will be no charter commission appointed. The current commissioners have no desire to do it. The minority on the committee thinks that the strong mayor is a bad form of government. That is not city club position. Your vote in favor of this minority will essentially put the city club back into the Crazy ages. There isn't a city in this country that hasn't abandoned the commission form, the five mayor form of government. Uh, there's only one other city over 80,000 that has it, that's Cedar uh, Rapids, Iowa, I believe. It's just no longer used. All the progressive cities in this nation have opted for strong mayor, and we should not put ourselves, we may be against this measure, but we should not vote against we should, the principle of strong mayor. I want to urge, Gretchen Kafori, member of the club, I want to urge the club to take a position today and suggest respectfully to my friend Paul that the city club has been wrong before and maybe what was right in 1930 and 1960 is no longer applicable. In the early 70s it took us four painful votes to get women admitted as members to this club. <laughs> based on their long-standing position that this was a men's private club. It is no longer that, and I would love to embrace the notion that the City Club of Portland would say, we have a damn good system of city government here.
I move the previous question. I believe once again we need a show of cards to get to two thirds in favor of moving the question now. If you're in favor of moving the question, hold your card. If you would like more discussion, now show me your card. It's pretty clear that the question is, is called. So, uh, all those in favor of approving the minority recommendation as being the city club's position, which is against measure 2630, raise your cards, please. All those opposed? Is that clear enough, or do we need to count? Clear enough? Thank you very much. In that case, the City Club of Portland has voted to um, move against the measure 2630. Thank you very much. Our thanks to Alan Brickley, Heather Metz, Brian Redd, and the members of the committee for a fine report. And please note that additional copies of the City Club reports are available in the office and on the club's website. Now, for those of you who've been patiently waiting for the rest of the program, and for those of you who've just joined us, um, I'm Paddy Tillett, President of the City Club. Welcome now to our Friday Forum on Philanthropy in Oregon and the effects on philanthropy in cities like Portland of losing cor por corporate headquarters. But first, of course, some announcements. Join us next Friday, May the 10th, for a program on the current status and future plans for TriMet, with TriMet General Manager Fra Fred Hansen. We will also have our report vote on ballot measure 13, so once again the program will begin early at 11.45. This program will be held in the Benson Hotel in the Mayfair Room, so please note the change of both time and location. I'd urge City Club members to make luncheon reservations online and receive our weekly bulletin via email. Please call the City Club office with your email address. Our board host seated at my far left is Doug Marker, member of the Board of Governors and second vice president of the club. He will have the privilege of asking the first question of our speakers. Following Doug's question, we'll open the program to questions from City Club members in the audience. Please be ready at the microphone with your question and state it as briefly as possible. And first, please identify yourself as a member of the City Club. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Portland General Electric, from CH2M Hill, and from Providence Health Systems, and we're most grateful for their support. Greg Chalet has led the Oregon Community Foundation for 15 years as its president. During that time, assets have increased from 7 million to 390 million, making it the 16th largest community foundation in the country. In 2001 alone, it gave away 28 million in grants and scholarships. The principal mission of the foundation is to serve Oregonians through the administration of individually tailored charitable funds. From 1994 until the year 2000, Mr. Chalet served on the board of directors of the Council on Foundations based in Washington, D.C., and he continues as a member of the Council's Inclusive Policies Committee, Practices Committee, rather. Mr. Chalet also serves on the executive committee of the Oregon Wildlife Heritage Foundation, is past president of the Oregon chapter of American Leadership Forum, and was a member of the Governor's Advisory Committee for the Prevention of Child Abuse. John Hampton is chair of the Oregon Community Foundation. Some time ago, as a recent graduate of the University of Washington, he began working in the forest industry when I was a lad. He subsequently founded Hampton Lumber Sales and went on to become CEO of Willamina Lumber Company and Affiliates in 1970. He's currently chair of Oregon's ninth largest company, Hampton Affiliates. Mr. Hampton's list of past directorships is impressive, and I'll mention only the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, Oregon State Board of Forestry, Pacific Corps, Portland Opera Association, and St. Vincent's Hospital, of which he's past chair. And just to keep him out of mischief, the directorships that he currently holds, in addition to chairing the foundation, include the Oregon Business Council, Portland Opera, Western Wood Products Association, and the World Forestry Center. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our very distinguished, and I may say extremely patient speakers, <laughs> Greg Chalet and John Hampton. Thanks to uh, Charlie Davis. We weren't sure we were going to get on today, Charlie. Thank you very much. Uh, 
But we're excited to be here, and it is an honor to uh, follow such a rousing debate. John uh, quipped to me that we could have followed Monica Lewinsky, so <laughs> we're hoping that, but she's old news, he said. So uh, we hope you have uh, room uh, in your minds to discuss another heady topic, and that's the topic of philanthropy in Oregon. John and I are pleased to release today the new Giving in Oregon report, and there are going to be copies of this report at the door when you leave, and I encourage you to take one. But this is a report about what Oregonians are doing to make our state better, about making Oregon stronger, and it's about doing more. It's about building Oregon through voluntary action, and because we are short for time, I'm going to get into the specifics of what we have been finding in our Giving in Oregon report. And I would like to start out by saying that I hope there's no doubt in your minds about the importance of philanthropy uh, in our state. Uh, lest you have doubts, last year the Oregon Food Bank uh, network of organizations reported statewide a 20% increase in requests for emergency food assistance. And in some counties in Oregon, the demand for emergency food assistance is over 50%. In Lake and Klamath counties, it's up to 100% increase over the prior year. The demand for emergency shelter care in Multnomah County was up 52% last year. And Oregon Health Sciences University is now projecting a cut of several million dollars for indigent health care. And this comes on the heels of one of our longest uh, serving neighborhood health clinics, neighborhood health clinics, which served over 5,000 uh, patients last year, closed its doors in February. And of course, we all have examples of schools, arts groups, and others who are working hard, harder than ever, to raise private dollars. There are many examples, and I'm sure you all have personal examples to share with us. Uh, I think of the Portland Parks, in which uh, in my neighborhood, the uh, neighborhood volunteers are now taking care of some basic park maintenance. I think that we're going to talk about giving of money, but also important is the giving of volunteer time. And we know that Oregonians are very generous with their volunteer contributions, but you're going to be surprised in a minute what I say about that. But volunteer time can only go so far, and in talking about money is very important because the lack of it, the lack of private donations, can make or break a worthy and needed community project. Well, you get the point that I'm trying to make is that philanthropy is very important in Oregon. So how are we doing with our philanthropy? I'm going to take a few minutes to review the findings of our survey and then John's going to talk particularly about business giving and the role of business giving in our state. In doing our research, we've been using several sources of information and we've been looking over the past decade at 44 nonprofit organizations, over a decade looking at private donations from individuals, businesses and foundations to these organizations. We call them the bellwethers. We also monitor IRS data and we measure the growth of Oregon foundations, and we look at the Oregon Progress's board, board's data on volunteering. Well, what have we found? And our Giving in Oregon Council is the group that has issued this report, and I'm pleased to say that we have a number of Giving in Oregon Council members here today. This group is a, consists of 24 leaders who represent the diverse sectors of philanthropy in our state, and we appreciate their assistance in completing this report. <clears throat> well, first we found that there's cause for optimism in terms of philanthropy. Oregonians who claim a charitable deduction compare favorably with our peers from other states. Oregon ranks 18th nationally in average charitable contribution per household. This is good since we rank 25th nationally in terms of our income. 18th in giving, 25th in income, so we're slightly ahead. Over the last decade, giving by individuals, as measured by gifts to our bellwethers, has increased steadily, growing in inflation-adjusted terms by 27% over the decade, which is about 2.5% per year. And very impressively, the assets of Oregon's charitable foundations have skyrocketed six, since 1990, more than doubling from $1.3 billion in 1990 to over $3.3 billion in 2001. And this growth in assets translates into today over $100 million more for our community in grants and scholarships. 
So the good news is we rank 18th in average contributions, individual giving is up, and foundation assets have doubled in 10 years. Despite these positive trends, we have cause for serious concern. First, giving by business as measured by our bellwethers has d dramatically declined over the decade, dropping by 36% from 1990 to 2001. This 36% decline has occurred despite a strong economy. With the decline in business giving, we've also seen an important shift in responsibility for funding nonprofit activities from the business sector to individuals. Ten years ago, our bellwethers received 30% of their donated income from business. Today it is only 15%. And with regard to volunteering, the Oregon Progress Board reports that Oregonians who regularly volunteer has dropped to a decade low, 23% of the adult population. And this compares to the national average of 30% of adults who regularly volunteer. The decline in business giving is particularly troublesome to us. What's going on? We need to look at this. This is a major factor in the health of our state. And John is going to talk about this in a minute. What are we to do? The Giving in Oregon Council feels strongly that more individual giving and volunteering are needed today and more business giving and more business leadership is needed. In order to move Oregon forward in charitable giving, the Giving in Oregon Council has come up with a new Oregon Charitable Giving Stimulus Plan. And this six-point plan provides an opportunity to move Oregon into the forefront in the nation in charitable giving. Briefly, there are six key points, and again, I encourage you to take a copy of the report. First, we should inspire every Oregonian to volunteer in their community at least 50 hours per year. This amount of hours, an average of one hour per week, has been set by the Oregon Progress Board as the standard for our state to achieve. Second, we should challenge each Oregonian to increase their giving increase their giving by one half percent of personal income for a state average donation of 2.7 percent of income. Think about that in terms of your own income. Oregonians who claim donations now on their tax returns give on average about two and a half percent. If Oregonians committed to give an additional one half percent of income, we would leapfrog from our current ranking as 18th in the nation to number three, trailing only Utah and Wyoming. For a family with an income of $50,000, that would be an additional contribution of just $250 per year. Should we be satisfied with 18th? We don't think so. Third, analyze the potential for establishing a state income tax deduction for all Oregon taxpayers. Currently, only 32% of Oregon taxpayers itemize their contributions and can claim a charitable deduction. There is potential for increasing giving by allowing the over 60% of taxpayers who do not itemize to claim a charitable, charitable contribution. Fourth, develop new leadership in the business community to encourage and recognize companies that give. And this role can be taken on by the Oregon Business Council, by Associated Oregon Industries, and local chambers of commerce. Five, ensure that all Oregon school children experience and learn the value of volunteering. Currently, our schools do a very mixed job of offering service and learning opportunities. And sixth and last, we must support nonprofit organizations to help them better recruit and use volunteers. Recruiting, training, and using volunteers is very difficult for many organizations, and foundations in particular can take the lead on this. If we achieve the six goals set out by this plan, we believe Oregon will benefit significantly. It will not be easy, and we will need everyone's support. The Giving in Oregon Council intends to enlist partners in achieving our goals, such as grant makers of Oregon and Southwestern Washington, the Northwest Giving Project, the Black United Fund, and the United Way. 
our success will be apparent in the quality of our life, of our communities, and in the compassion we show our neighbors. And now, John Hampton. Thank you, Greg. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be with such an animated group of people. Uh, we didn't really forecast this kind of uh, reception. Um, I'm hoping that at the conclusion of my remarks, we will be able to avoid having a majority and a minority report on my comments. Um, I've spoken before to the City Club, and I'm familiar with your stringent rules about time. And I can tell you that I've read this to my wife, and I know how long it's going to take. And I promise to stick to my script because I have a tendency to go off on flights of fancy, to pursue tangential thoughts that come through my head when I'm supposed to be reading my material. But I'm going to try to behave myself today. <laughs> uh, so here we go. Uh, Calvin Coolidge was not my favorite president, but he said one thing that made a lot of sense in 1925. He said, the business of the American people is business. I don't think he thought far enough into the subject because he should have added, and the business of business should include philanthropy. Profits can translate into environmentally responsible growth, family stability through stable employment, and taxes that support our schools and our public services. Profits are a very critical part of the equation, but profit needs to be coupled with civic mindedness, responsibility, and heart. For profit to translate into strong families and stable communities, resources must go back into the community by our generous and thoughtful philanthropy. In short, I want to talk about business investing in the community as a measure of business success, because I think we'd all agree that the business of America is more than just business. Oregon Communities Foundation's report giving in Oregon makes it clear why charitable giving is so important to our community. The, this report's convinced me again that Oregonians and the business community in particular must broaden and deepen our base of giving. How do we nurture and build a strong philanthropic ethic here in Oregon? It's easy to make the case for charitable giving as vital to our health and stability and to our state as a whole. All you have to do is think about taking away that money and our youth suffer, our arts and cultures languish, our nonprofit organizations falter and destroy the balance that they provide with government services. Art, music, theater are not simply amenities. They are critical to all of our lives. They are the thread that holds the fabric of our society together, and they depend on our support. <clears throat> An effective way to encourage people to give is to set an example. Take it from a reformed Grinch. <laughs> <laughs> Philanthropy feels great. It's a complicated thing, however. When we are born on this earth, we are given the instinctive need to protect ourselves. And giving away our security blanket is not an easy thing to learn how to do. But even when we give, and give generously, we often want to keep our philanthropy quiet. Perhaps we feel embarrassed to make public our commitments. Perhaps we fear being besieged by requests for support, and I have learned how to say no. Uh, however, I've also learned that one important way to encourage charitable giving is to be open about your own giving when it's appropriate. When I agreed to co-chair the opera's $25 million stabilization drive, I realized that it was important to make a, a leadership gift. However, I was very uncomfortable about making the commitment public. Uh, after protracted discussion with the opera development staff, I was convinced that if I were going to be effective and credible in talking with potential donors, major donors, I would have to make my pledge in the campaign visible. Standing here now, I can think of a number of very significant pledges to the opera drive that we were able to obtain because the person I asked knew that Carol and I cared enough to make a leadership gift. I still squirm a little in the spotlight, but the fact is that very often, Giving begets giving. Now let me mention a few charitable organizations that I see making a huge difference. I'm particularly interested in early intervention, so our company was eager to support the SMART program, S-M-A-R-T, Start Making a Reader Today. 
by providing three-year grants in both Yamhill and Tillamook counties, where we have sawmills, to get a volunteer apparatus established and a county director on site to lead the program. Programs and institutions such as SMART enhance learning capacity at an early age, and that's useful throughout the formal education experience and beyond. Another example is the Eugene-based Birth Through Three organization, which Oregon Community Foundation has supported. Early assistance to get these kids started right is great leverage for better outcomes. If the arts and culture are as important to you as they are to my wife and to me, you can support anything from small, very local, nonprofit organizations to well-established institutions that enrich our culture with history, music, and the visual arts. <clears throat> and dance, <clears throat> such as our interest in Portland Opera, the Oregon Symphony, the Portland Art Museum, Pacific Northwest College of Art, the High Desert Museum, and Body Vox. <laughs> <laughs> Those are just some of the areas of need in our state where Carol and I believe we can make a difference, and there is no limit to how focused or how eclectic each of us can be in giving our support. In responding to these growing needs in our state, Foundation and individual giving has increased in the past decade. <clears throat> However, as we just learned from Greg, support, support from the business sector has declined precipitously. I'd like to take a minute to focus on what that suggests about the changing face of Oregon business. Bus business giving has significantly declined despite, despite the strong economy at the end of the decade, not counting the one-year moratorium that we had on success, uh, and if you want to take the, the uh, if you want to change the world, the axiom is that a good place to start is in your own backyard. Many corporate headquarters have left our backyard. In the last 20 years, Oregon has lost as headquarters companies, Georgia Pacific, Fred Meyer, Evans Products, U.S. Bank, Willamette Industries, Portland General, Pacific Corp, and I learned today, Meyer and Frank is moving its headquarters to California. <clears throat> While some of these companies continue to provide volunteers and donations to local organizations, in many cases, their donations are significantly down. For example, when Quest took over U.S. West, it closed the U.S. West Foundation to our state's detriment. There are exceptions to this trend. For instance, the Weyerhaeuser Company has committed that it will continue Willamette Industries' philanthropic giving in Oregon for five years. And that's in addition, of course, to what Weyerhaeuser itself will support as well. Many businesses give conscientiously and generously. Northwest Natural, Standard Insurance, Portland General, Joe Weston, and U.S. Bank Corp., to name just a few. But as the base of headquarters companies erodes, the weight of meeting critical needs falls on new donors, many of whom don't yet understand the importance of giving. It's time to reach out aggressively to the vast numbers of relatively uninvolved small and medium-sized businesses in Oregon. I was impressed to learn that there are 103,000 small businesses in Oregon, that is, with less than 1,000 employees. And of the 103,000, 100,000 of these small businesses have between one employee and 50 employees. 100,000 businesses. Uh, simple mathematics will tell you that if we could get each of these 100,000 small businesses to increase their giving by $1,000 per year, that would provide us with a new philanthropic annual contribution of $100 million. I hope you're listening out there. <laughs> we should provide leadership and encouragement in their adoption of stronger philanthropic ethics. This gets back to setting a good and generous example of giving and letting people know that you gave when it's appropriate. We should remember that small businesses can become large businesses. Fred Meyer, one of the Northwest's great, greatest entrepreneurs, is a fine example. Not only was he a hugely successful small businessman who became a large businessman, his estate established one of our region's largest philanthropic private foundations. A similar great story involves Kenneth Ford, who built a huge forest products company from a one-man, one-truck fuel wood business in Roseburg, Oregon. The Meyer Memorial Trust and the Ford Family Foundation exemplify what can happen when a business grows. Those two foundations have grown to more than $1 billion. 
and distributed grants take, uh, totaling over $50 million last year alone. Not everyone can or aspire to do what these men did, but as Fred Meyer said, in all giving, give thought. With thoughtful giving, even small sums may accomplish great purposes. I believe that every Oregon business should have a giving plan and that every individual Oregonian with the means should give what he or she can. There are resources that can help us become wise and effective donors. For example, the Hampton family works with the Oregon Community Foundation where we maintain an advised fund. <clears throat> this is like having our own foundation for now. We use Oregon Community Foundation because it does the work that we want done charitably at very nominal cost. Uh, Carol and I have also made plans to establish a Hampton Family Foundation within Oregon Community Foundation when our estates are finalized. Our four children will comprise the committee that will evaluate grant requests, some of which will reflect our current interest in arts and cultural institutions and, of course, other emerging needs that will come over time. And this will ensure our support of our community permanently with minimal cost leaving more funds to support needed appetites because of Oregon Community Foundation's lower costs. Now that's an unadulterated plug in case you didn't notice. <laughs> For our family business, we, bit, we give because we believe it's our responsibility to invest in the community, communities in which we do business. And it is not always cash. Our company has always seen more opportunities for investment than we have had the funds to deploy. And consequently, we look for opportunities that have the most leverage, and the same principle holds true in our giving. For example, recently we donated a piece of property in downtown Willamina, which we had acquired a long, long time ago and which had no effective use for us. The city has been able to build a new fire station on that property, manned by the local volunteer firemen's organization, uh, which was only modest cost to us, but of great value to the community, including better fire protection for our plant. We're now finalizing the gift of a 20-acre log pond, which is no longer needed by our old plywood plant, and which the city will make into a new pond for fishing for the local citizens. The city's old fish pond will be used as a tertiary sewage treatment facility, saving the local community some $350,000. That's leverage. And two years ago, we also gave 10 acres of some low-cost non-industrial land to the city of Sheridan for a new Little League ball field and soccer field. Low cost to us? Large value to the community, great leverage. One tool you might find helpful as you think about establishing a giving plan is the Oregon Community Foundation's Oregon Business Giving Workbook. If you have, if you have a business, get this guide from Greg Chalet, read it and act. To be truthful, I learned more about the importance of business uh, of giving from friends and colleagues who showed me how to give and why it's important, but it took a long time. I like to tell the story about how I, how I got started with philanthropy with Portland Opera Association. <clears throat> about 30 years ago, my friend Peter Curler was chairman of the opera board, and he was downcast because he was having problems, and he invited me to come on the board, which I did. And in due course, the annual fund drive came around, and I made my contribution. Uh, several months later, Peter came back to see me, and he said, we're short on the annual fund drive. I'm planning to make an additional donation. What about you? And I said, you must be kidding, I gave you $100. <laughs> I hate to tell you, that's a true story. <laughs> anyway, I've learned better since then. <laughs> if you don't believe it, go look at the major gifts on the opera campaign. Uh, the wonderful success of the Oregon Community Foundation demonstrates to me that many Oregonians are generous and willing to be involved. From its modest inception in 1974, with only $60,000 of contributed capital from several Portland business leaders who were gotten together by Bill, Bill Swindell Sr., the Oregon Community Foundation Fund has now 800 individual charitable funds with total assets of over $400 million, and that's after distributing over $200 million over the 28 years of its grants, grant making. Oregon Community Foundation's rapid growth is largely a product of more exposure statewide to more people of what Oregon Community Foundation can do for them. We need a concerted effort to explain the case around the state for philanthropic needs. We will see an incredible increase in state giving if we educate people about the need and the ability that they have to perform. 
I think we need to adopt the six-point stimulus plan in the giving in, or, uh, giving in Oregon report that Greg just gave you, and I so move. <laughs> Thank you. All those in favor say aye. aye. I think we have a consensus. An exciting new organization affiliated with Oregon Community Foundation is Social Venture Partners. Its mission is to develop philanthropy and volunteerism from individuals in the business and professional communities. They use the venture capital approach as a model, and Social Venture Partners members donate $5,000 each to a pooled fund. In addition to money, they also give time and expertise to help not-for-profit organizations become stronger. Information about this organization is on the table in here as well. There are other organizations uh, promoting business support for, for philanthropy. I'm pleased to say that the Oregon Business Committee for Arts and Culture is experiencing significant growth through the active involvement of its several past presidents and the recruitment of its excellent executive director. She happens to be here, uh, Virginia Willard. In addition, we've seen major successes in strengthening the financial capabilities and stability of the Portland Art Museum, the Portland Opera, and the Oregon Symphony. Clearly, clearly, the, way, the means and the will are within our grasp. And then there is the newly formed Oregon Cultural Trust established by the state legislature. With this, we fully expect Oregon to leap far ahead of its current dismal and humiliating place as in the lowest 10% of the nation in state support for cultural and arts institutions. This is not Oregon in action that we know. The Cultural Trust will not only encourage individual and business giving, but will also provide the opportunity for additions to the endowment in the future by the legislators. It's hoped that the Trust will reach a goal of $200 million in 10 years. An informational campaign about the Trust will be initiated in early fall to explain the tax advantages of making voluntary contributions to not-for-profits and then uh, making a donation to the, the, uh, the new foundation, the Cultural Trust, uh, and getting a direct tax credit for that donation, which can be $500 for an individual and $2,500 for a business. There will be more information about this later. It's a little complicated to begin with. Uh, and now I've come to the time when I ask you to examine your capacity and direct your giving to the things that you care about. Please contact Greg at the Oregon Community Foundation for information on how to make philanthropy part of your personal or business priorities, how you can achieve support of the institutions that you care about. Volunteering and providing incentives for your employees to volunteer is also a wonderful way to begin developing a philanthropic attitude. <clears throat> I believe that Oregonians, when informed, when asked, and when given the right tools, will give generously, and that will be true success. I began by quoting Calvin Coolidge that the business of the American people is business. I'd like to include with Oregon's late great poet laureate, William Stafford, who said, do it now and do it all. I believe that with success comes not the obligation, but the privilege of giving back to your community. <clears throat> I hope that what I've said today to you will cost you money. <laughs> because what you will get in return, not even money can buy. Thank you. Well, I'd like to direct the uh, first question to Greg, and it has to do with the um, improving and supporting sound business practices of nonprofits. Uh, as a board member of City Club, I know that our board spends a great deal of time talking about our practices and managing our funds wisely, but we're an 85-year-old organization, and we're blessed with professional staff and experienced board members. But I assume that the ex expectation is that m many of the needs in our community will um, be addressed by emerging organizations struggling to get started, struggling to recruit board members, and struggling to maintain staff on non at nonprofit salaries. So Greg, could you talk a little bit about what is available to help new nonprofits along and establish sound objectives and establish sound business practices that are so important to funders? Uh, good question, Mark. Uh, I think that is an area of real concern that we see. First of all, I think the inclination on the part of nonprofits is to put money into services and not into uh, things necessary to be efficient businesses. 
One area that we know for a lot of grassroots organizations that they're weak on is technology. They don't have access to technology as some of our larger organizations have. And I think we need to, foundations and donors need to look at that as an area of contribution. Also, we're seeing around the state uh, some efforts by organizations like Technical Assistance for Community Service, Tax, to create more opportunity for nonprofit leaders to learn and benefit from experienced uh, leaders in the field for management practices. And then we're also uh, at the Oregon Community Foundation working closely with a network of community colleges and several other groups mm -hmm. to create management training programs. And I think that this is a, the area you mentioned is a greatly uh, uh, misunderstood area of importance for the effectiveness uh, of the nonprofit sector. So we need to do more. Andrew, K Andrew Kayser, City Club member. Several years ago, I inherited a fair amount of money, and in order to do an anonymous gift, I gave several gifts in the name of my dog, Bruno. <laughs> um, Bruno now gets two pieces of mail a week. This is now five years ago, including invitations for Visa affinity cards. Plus, he gets phone calls. Um, I, I guess um, my experience, along with people I know, other people I know, is that we give money, and it seems like money gets burned up in the solicitation process from charities in which our names are loaned out to. I was curious if you could speak to that. Are you addressing the question to me? You're witty, please. Uh, <laughs> I didn't call you. <laughs> but now I'll call Bruno. Uh, it is an unremitting stream of mail which comes to our, our, our home address uh, unsolicited. Uh, Carol and I have an unlisted telephone number uh, because we just don't like to be interrupted at home by solicitors. And you do have the option of having a designated mark by your telephone number in the book, a paw mark if you like for Bruno. Uh, but uh, um, uh, it is possible to slow down that uh, incoming mail. I have in my uh, area where the mail is sorted, we have an island in our kitchen area, and uh, that's the tabletop for all the incoming mail. And within easy sailing distance, I have a cardboard box that is about this big. And it's very easy just to play roulette with that thing. And I don't have any trouble dismissing those that I don't want to respond to. And I think we all have to make choices. We, none of us has sufficient resources to be able to respond to every important need. And so I think it's just up to us to be the, the, the judges about what's OK and what isn't OK. Uh, Tom Deering, a City Club member. Uh, John is, a, is a, a great example of the way traditional business in Oregon has, at, at its very best, has supported charitable giving. Uh, I wonder if the drop in the business giving over the last 10 years is related at all to the rise of the high-tech uh, element in business. I know this is a theme that comes up repeatedly, uh, that uh, this part of our business community has traditionally not been as much aware and has not been as forthcoming in supporting charity. And specifically, what I'd like to ask is, uh, Greg, are there things going on that uh, are addressing specifically uh, this uh, perhaps uh, uh, lag in our uh, uh, in the power of our business giving and individual giving in Portland? Uh, Tom, not only are we seeing a shift to high tech, but once, what's very interesting is to look at the number of foreign owned or foreign based companies that are now big employers in Oregon. And these companies don't have traditions yet for giving. Uh, and I, I don't want to pick any one out, but I think that we've seen that shift in ownership of our corporate uh, employers. And it's a couple of good things that are happening. Uh, Social Venture Partners, which uh, John just mentioned, is uh, nurturing a tradition of giving and learning among uh, younger entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs from different sectors. Uh, also, there's a program called uh, Northwest Giving Project, which has done some 
outreach into the high tech uh, community and actually put on seminars about uh, developing a personal financial plan with a giving plan and setting goals. So I think there are some exciting new developments in this area. I think also what is very important though that John mentioned, and I hope you got it, is individual leadership is really needed. And I think that we need to, those business leaders and business people who are giving need to really uh, make the ask, as John is now doing for the opera and about a dozen other organizations as well. I'd like to add to that that uh, Scott Gibson, who is now a director of Oregon Community Foundation, gave a talk at our annual luncheon either two or three years ago and explained the reason why high-tech uh, uh, executives are somewhat reluctant to give. It is recent money that has been accumulated, recent wealth that has accumulated. They are young people that have young families. They're concerned about their education and their future. And, and much of their wealth is centered in their stock, which has sort of taken a, a dive lately. So there's, there's a fragile sort of foundation behind that business growth. Uh, in addition to which, you've given me a perfect segue to explain that in Oregon, 10 years ago, we were uh, processing eight and a half billion feet of timber per year on a sustainable basis. And because the federal timber supply has disappeared under President Clinton, we are now at a level of three and a half billion feet, and that means that more than one half the lumber mills in Oregon went away during Clinton's administration. So many of those businesses are gone who used to provide that local support, particularly in rural areas. Thank you very much for Tom. <laughs> Steve Novick, City Club member. Mr. Chalet, Mr. Hampton, I hesitate to ask this question because it might sound like I don't honor the work you do, and I, and I do. But the five rich guys who fund Bill Sizemore understand that, unfortunately, money talks in politics. And I wonder if many philanthropists who don't agree with Sizemore recognize that in some cases, investing in politics might be more effective than investing in philanthropy. If you've got a million dollars, you can give a million dollars to a couple of schools, and you care about schools, you can give a million dollars to a couple of schools, or you can spend a third of a million beating Bill Sizemore's next initiative, a third of a million funding a local option school levy campaign in your district, and a third of a million electing a governor who doesn't propose to gut school funding by cutting the capital gains tax in half. And I'm just wondering if you think that many philanthropists who are moderates or liberals consider that grim calculus in deciding where to put their money. Okay, Greg. <laughs> Steve, my answer is why not do both? And, uh, you know, you should do both. And you can't get a ta tax deduction for putting it into politics, but you should do both. So that's my answer. Betsy, War Betsy Warren, our city club member. And I have a question related to something that many people are concerned about, which is the increasing gap in income between the richest and the poorest, both in our community and in our state and our nation and the world. And the concern is that uh, not only does this threaten community stability, but it also potentially in the future threatens democracy. My question is, um, starting with Mr. Chalet, what do you think would be the two or three best uses of giving to try to reduce eventually the income gap? Two or three, huh? <laughs> uh, good question. I think that uh, obviously education uh, would, be, would be number one on the list. And I think that what we're seeing, and the foundation puts a lot of effort into, into K through 12 education and higher education, but what we're seeing is that a lot of kids are, are really having trouble going to school these days. And there's a growing indebtedness for kids that are coming out of college and access to education is becoming a problem. And I think that's very important, addressing the education gap. I think also, um, uh, it, in a, in a way related to philanthropy, but it's diversifying the economy. If you look at the, the growth of service industry in Oregon, which is generally tends to be low-wage jobs, and that's where a lot of growth is occurring, is that we're not diversing, diversifying our economy enough. And some foundations are focusing a lot in the area of biotech research and supporting diversification of our health sciences industries. And I think the future of Oregon will be stronger if we diversify in that arena. I would just add the early, the early intervention part is a really strong emphasis in my uh, book. Uh, we, have to, we have to have visible for them 
the potential for upward mobility to provide the motivation. But then if we provide the tools at that early age, when, when these kids can learn to learn, learn to read more effectively, retain information better, be better students as a product of learning better to read is an example of how I think we can move ahead faster.